So Martin, an interesting, forward-looking discussion with Dr. Marcus Player, president of FATF, and so many takeaways. Yeah, I'm, my primary takeaway is I think we have a new leader for AML. I was struck by his enthusiasm, his passion, his understanding of our subject, his commitment to it, and the way he connects it to issues that prevail, COVID-19, social inclusion, data, data privacy. He's a man that's going to take us on a, an impressive two-year journey, I hope. Yeah, very much so. I mean, he covered so many areas. There was the technology, data sharing, the risk side, the training. So looking at the technology, he referred to digital tools as being the next step for improving the AML framework. For MLROs, what do you think that actually means? I think he's seen it in action. I think he's confident of its ability to take us further forward. It's the next step. He wants to engage with the technologists as well as law enforcement. He wants to bring the AML minds together adjacent to and working with the technologists to get the right technology to get improved outcomes. So Martin, presumably the MLROs really do need to keep up to speed with these new emerging technologies, very much part and parcel of the job. They need to fully exploit what the technology can do for them. It's a new era. Um, the technology can replicate their thinking 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, in different parts of their business across a global enterprise. It can therefore ensure that what they want, what they think, and how they want to detect money laundering, how they want to train staff, it can do so many things for them. And what Dr. Marcus Player said was, the computer will come up with the answers, just give it the right data. Yeah, you've, you've just reminded me, he actually was referring to new tech, helping us to be smarter and more effective. And then he actually sort of went down into the details. So for example, he was talking about encryption, Again, from a practical perspective, presumably this is all to do with the security side. It is, but also don't forget he talked about respect for and acknowledgement of the human rights privacy. So he's speaking to the data protection community and he wants encryption to give them the confidence that he is, he is protecting that data. And again, on the, the tech side, when we're looking at improvements, KYC, CDD, um, lots of discussion about that generally in the, co the community. Do you see any leap, leaps forward there? It wraps into his talk about the risk-based approach, perhaps less work on low risk, data pooling, data harmonisation. Is there a need for different data sets for the Fortune 500 companies? Should we not all be using the same KYC data for those companies? And again, risk identification, um, he was emphasising this is not a tick box exercise. Any thoughts on that? Big change that came out of plenary last week and he talked about today was that sanctions compliance is no longer tick box. It's not good enough to say that the LLP entity, a uh, high risk address in the UK, is not sanctioned. You now need to know who's behind that LLP entity. And if you're in a correspondent banking supply chain, you need to know that your client, if your client is a bank in Latvia who's banking this UK LLP entity, you need to know that they know that the people behind that LLP entity are not themselves sanctioned. So in a nutshell, tech is all about a um, more effective, less costly uh, framework. That was an important point. He said, you know, the technology will save you money. Big on effectiveness. The FATF have long been talked about effectiveness. It was the first time I've heard somebody from the FATF talk about efficiency. So now moving on to the risk areas. Um, interestingly, he was referring to the weakest link and um, he gave the example of cryptocurrencies. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? Well, he did talk about how you can access the global financial system through a cryptocurrency from anywhere in the world. He did talk about how, therefore, the FATF have seen this. They've given out um, rules and, and suggested standards around that. They're going to publish guidance in the near future to help people with that. Perhaps he does at the moment perceive that crypto is one of the weakest links in the present financial system. There's no doubt that people really do need to understand these developments in the crypto area. It's certainly moving very quickly. Um, the other area he highlighted, again, a risk area, were the COVID-related risks. 
And again, I found it very interesting in that he was giving very specific examples. Uh, so for example, cybercrime. Um, I was going to suggest we go through each of those. So cybercrime, any thoughts on that? It ties back to crypto. Nobody knows the benefits of crypto in a criminal context better than the criminals, which is why some people assert that there are huge volumes of transactions in crypto that are criminal related. So there's a need for people to be aware of criminals using crypto, perhaps connected to a different COVID crime. The other areas he mentioned were counterfeit medical supplies and also um, these um, fake uh, fundraising charities. From a practical perspective, what should be on the MLRO's mind at the moment? Well, these fake um, goods, it's a supply and demand situation. So if a company was formed eight weeks ago and it's now supplying um, PPI or medical equipment, is it? What's it what, what is its background and its criteria? You know, when we see healthcare, health products reference, we look. We should be looking for the age of the company, the location of the company. Does it have solely a registered address or does it have a genuine operating address? We can use Google Maps for that. And then the charities and the funding, if it, you know, we've seen it before, criminals exploit tragedy. The tsunami, 9-11, they identify opportunities because there are benevolent people who want to give and help people in their hour of need. So new transactions that reference for the benefit of charitable donation to, payment for, um, charitable contributions, those kind of words, we should be looking for that in our transactions and seeking to protect the donors actually from the fraudsters. Mm -hmm. So moving on to data, um, at the end of the day, you can't discuss um, tech or risk without talking about data. And uh, Dr. Player was talking about a big jump. Data sharing could be a big jump. Um, but he also sort of recognised that balance with human rights. Um, again, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, sometimes in our, our own business, correspondent banking and data sharing, if we have issues or concerns about a customer's customer, that can be overridden by consent. We can ask our customer for consent from their customer to have the information. In his world, in the bigger world, um, data sharing, he's definitely looking for new opportunities to improve that. He referenced Gemly in the UK, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, and I know they've been extremely successful in preventing terrorist attacks, in providing information that's helped the authorities to counter terrorist attacks. So he's quoted that particular um, mechanism and wants to see further development of that. I think he wants to see more harmonised data. He did talk about that pooled data. And of course, wrap it around technology. The technology only works well if you give it the right data to work with in the first place. Mm. The theme that's been running through this as well is training. And um, he certainly shared our passion about training and had that wonderful quote where he was talking about training being an investment into our future. Um, any thoughts um, on that side? More widely, he said training should be tailored and scoped for specific audiences. So if you're still using a one-size-fits-all AML training product, you're probably making a mistake and an error. Senior AML people and financial crime people are right now anxious about the development of and the training of young AML analysts because they're not overhearing a conversation in the office from which they would ordinarily learn. So even your company, the ICA, need to be looking at how can you develop um, quarterly training bulletins and briefings for these junior analysts. We need as a community to, yes, invest in our future because some great experienced AML people are going to leave in the pandemic and not go back to work. And, and that experience and expertise leaves and goes out the door with them. So we need to identify how we can make sure all of that knowledge doesn't go out the door and we do pass it on to the next generation and invest in, in our future and their future. Mm. So heaps of work to do. And as I say, let's find out where we are next year. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to speaking to you again and him again. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>